start rolling upstairs for just a second if y'all want to just go over to I was like, I have that same guitar. And I was like, oh, that is my guitar. <laughs> We're protecting it up here for you. Thank you. Um, how are you? I'm good. Welcome to the house. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This is full circle for you. I mean, you, you played a bunch of house shows in the early days, didn't you? We played many, many house shows, yeah. yeah. I mean, the career arc has been, never mind your personal arc, the career arc for this band has been pretty incredible. I've been really lucky, you yeah. know, like from a... From my 14-year-old punk standpoint, like I've been able to 100% fully realize all of my teenage punk rock dreams. I mean, know? that's incredible. Yeah. And now, like, just playing with Green Day must be a real treat because that's your first show, wasn't it? First concert ever. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not just first punk show, just first concert ever. What do you remember from that first show? Um, well, I remember that we had to ask my friend Dustin, who went with us or went with me. I had to ask, we had to ask his dad to drive us, and I remember we took the like spray on hair dye yeah. and dyed our hair green. And then by the end of the show, it had all like sweated down and dyed our skin green. And I remember <laughs> standing waiting for Green Day to come on, and they were playing Rancid over oh. the like PA. Yeah. And we knew who Rancid was, and there was like two girls in front of us who were like, "What's this? I want Green Day to come on?" And both me and Dustin were like, "Oh." we know who this is, yeah. you know, like they don't know who this is, we're in. And that was kind of like my first experience, I guess, with like punk rock elitism, right. I guess, if you want to put it but like that. But also like feeling cool. The first time you get to feel cool is a real thing. Oh, totally, yeah. And I had like, I had John, uh, Dead Kennedy's logo on the shirt I was wearing. <laughs> and I remember like a way older than me punker was like, cool shirt, kid. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, like, like awesome. <laughs> like, and, oh. and so was that first time that you were actually on stage playing and they're playing on the same tour? What's that been like? Well, the first time we, yeah. we, we shared the stage with them was in 2005. We did Giant Stadium, and um, that was just, like, unreal. I mean, flying into Newark, you literally flew over Giant Stadium, mm -hmm. and I was looking out the plane window and saw the stage down below the, the, the plane. And, I mean, there were so many surreal moments that night. Like, you know, there was, like, flying in, sure, and then, like, playing the show and looking back and being like, whoa, Trey Cool and Billy Joe and Mike Turner watching our band play right now. This is so, and there's the bouncing souls. And like, it was really like a great feeling. And then like afterwards, I remember this was like my favorite moment was when the band was playing Wake Me Up When September Ends. I went out in the audience and was watching them. And Kenny G was there with his kids and took out his Blackberry cell phone and was waving it in the air. As like a lighter. Played. Yeah, yeah. It was so surreal. So surreal. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, when you realize all those punk rock dreams, what comes next? Like, what, what are your new dreams? I, I I don't know. You know, I mean, like, that's not to say I'm, like, lacking in ambition in any yeah. way. It's just, like, a really great feeling of having, like, like feeling like, okay, you know, like, now, like, I don't know, keep on blazing a trail, you yeah. know? Like, or just, like, now go into the unknown, you know? And, like... Is, is, it a, is it a second career for you? No. You know, I honestly, like, really... Feel like I've been able to look at it in a healthy way as far as like if you are going to be a lifer and if you're really committed to something you have to accept that there'll be peaks and valleys and that like there'll just be different stages in what you're doing and like sometimes people be really into it and other times people won't be into a record and sometimes you know like it just things happen you know and but there'll what, be good tours and bad tours. And what's the emotional work you have to do to be okay with that because a lot of artists are artists and it's hard to figure that out. I think it's really about abandoning ego you know and like making sure that you take it all kind of in the same way and that you take the criticism in the same way as you do the praise and that that's not making or breaking breaking your reasoning for doing what you're doing um and just looking for the like looking for the positive in any situation or what you know like what you can make out of what's going on as opposed to like being consumed by it is like how i try to always view it as band members change and new dynamics come in how do you feel about it to me, that's always been kind of like the the thing with against me, you know, like my band doesn't have that mythology of like four people entered a room and picked up their instruments right. and against me sound was born, you know, it was always like a bedroom project where then I realized, oh, it's more fun to play with other people. But especially when starting out younger, realizing like, okay, well, we're not making money off this. So like, I'm going to have to accept that people are going to come and go. Yeah. And if I want to keep doing it, then I'll, you know, like find other people to do it and having the flexibility to be one person, two people, three people, four piece, five piece, you know, like ha keeps it interesting. And, you know, to me, honestly, anytime we've like changed lineup as far as like a new drummer or rhythm section, it just totally changes your possibilities of what to do with songs. And it also adds new life to older songs, sometimes older songs that have died and like you've lost interest in playing just because there's new life to it and a new approach. Well, and you know, if you think Adam on drums and you think about Inge on, on bass, like you look at 
they've played a lot of shows with a lot of other bands too. Oh, totally. Really yeah. cool bands as well. Right. And, and they teach you things about what against me could be? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, trust me, like, it's not lost on me. And I geek out regularly where I'll have those moments where I'll look back and I'll be like, oh my God, that's the drummer from Rocket from the Crypt. You know, like, or, oh my God, Inge was totally an international noise conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I geek out over that stuff and it makes me really happy, you know? Like, um, but I just know too that it's like, okay, this is so amazing to be in a place where like everyone's at that same level of like, we're all doing it for the same reasons. Right. Everyone's completely committed to their own thing, you know, like drums, bass, guitar, whatever. And knowing that everyone's on the same page like that, as opposed to like struggling and fighting because not everyone's really committed to the same vision is really great. Well, I think one of the things about Against Me that I love so much, especially when I, in the early days listening to you and, and it maintains, but right around the early time was just how engaged socially it was more politically but socially like sure. this was a responsible band and i always respect it i respect it so much that you did that and you did it before everybody started hating george bush like it was part of the dna of against me from the very beginning sure yeah and that has started changed. during clinton yeah, yeah, that's so, right. yeah. <laughs> You're like we hit a ball when bill was the president <laughs> yeah i mean and honestly i try to have that perspective now with like the trump administration of being like all right you know against me started when during the clinton pregnant pregnant pregnancy yeah. presidency and then was there through bush and yeah. obama and now here we are in trump you know and and I mean, that was, you know, those were the lessons that like my punk elders passed down to me, you know, and, and especially like translating that on a personal level of like, that it's not just about saying like, you know, fuck the system or something like that, that your emotions are political, the way you interact with people and the way you treat your friends, the way you treat your band, the way you like, the way you socialize is a political act. In fact, that's the most important kind of politics, isn't it? It's the most real. Yeah. Well, then, but your presence alone is political just by you being you. I, I mean, I, I don't take that for granted, for sure. You know, as a responsibility as well? Sure, yeah. And you like that? I, I don't look at it as a like or dislike. Right. I just look at, like, that's the fact, you know? Right. And you see the power in it, too, I suppose. Sure. I mean, and some of that's, like, a little bit selfish in a survival mode, you know, like, of knowing, like, okay, walking into a situation as a trans person, especially, and realizing, like, if you make someone uncomfortable, of, like, for so long of having been a trans person who's scared of who they are, of realizing, like, oh, actually, I have the power over you right now because you're really uncomfortable by me, as opposed to being intimidated because someone's, you know, like, uncomfortable with you, you know, that doesn't make any sense. You told me something the last time we spoke, which is so interesting, how you would be on stage and you would see something somebody who had transitioned and you would be looking at them over the course of their, your career and your relationship with them and seeing them go through this and how much that was in a way inspiring to you. For sure. And your relationship with your fans is so insane. I remember when you signed with the major label, how people freaked out. Right. How did that feel for you when that was happening? You know, it, it felt like, it felt like you're fighting with a friend. You know, whereas like you wanted your friend to be able to understand from your side yeah. and like at the same time while realizing that there were certain things, especially then, you know, of like there are certain things about me that I know I'm not telling you fully, but at the same time, I'm really scared that if I were to tell you that, that how you would react, yeah. but we're in this relationship together and I wish you would just trust me on this. Yeah. So that was kind of the dynamic oftentimes, you know? And also, and I remember thinking about this on the air, like you've never led them astray anyway, artistically, you didn't make any choices that were different sure in that scenario sure no totally i mean and, and i mean really like you know even with signing to sire like that was a lot of part motivated by like the history of the label and Fucking for ramones, me like man. yeah the ramones <laughs> replacements yeah. and even like uh, for me like madonna seymour stein signed madonna and madonna was like my my first memory of like wanting to be a musician was seeing madonna so to have that opportunity to work like be a part of that lineage was always like something I was like really excited about, you know? When do you feel like you're your most Madonna on stage? Do you actually feel that now? <laughs> you ever have that moment? Um, like I during know. a song? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I had you, here's your set list tonight. Where are you your most powerful? <laughs> my, my most powerful, my most Madonna in there, um, I'm going to say probably during True Trans. Yeah, yeah? Yeah. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it. So uh, Lineage and legacy is important, especially if you have punk rock roots, right? Sure. You want to. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, I was very lucky to interview Joe Strummer about a year before he passed, and he said to me, "So many artists are trying to be timeless." He goes, "And that's not the responsibility. The responsibility is to be of your time, right? You know." And when you were coming up, who were you listening to that was that? 
when I was coming yeah. up, well, probably bands that weren't very much of my time, you know? <laughs> well, but timeless, um, we make them timeless. Right, sure. Right, yeah. I mean, like, the English peace punk bands were the, my bands, you know, coming up initially, like Crass, Omega Tribe, yeah. Zounds, The Mob, yeah. um, and then the Profane Existence scene in Minneapolis was, like, my jam, you know? Um, and That's you know, real heavy. That's, like, real shit. But it, it was, it, like, all seemed connected to me, you know, like the Bay Area scene, like all those different, like it kind of has changed now because of the internets, but there's those pockets where it's like, oh, you all took that idea that was the initial spark from punk rock and then you applied it to your own city and your own scene and you grew it into right. this unique thing and now you're doing your own totally unique thing and that's punk because it doesn't sound like this other thing, you know, and nothing's homogenized. Um, so those scenes like really influenced me and I mean, I just, I tried to draw from everywhere, you well, know? Were you, I mean, and I say this with no judgment because I've spent a lot of time listening to music from around there. But when you're young and you go to Florida, Florida is a strange state. In yes. The Union. <laughs> yes. And there's um, a lot of great music that's come from Florida. Mm -hmm. But when you got there, did you feel like there was something that you could connect to in terms of a scene? No, especially South Florida. And in South Florida, in particular, at the time, like, you know, no bands went that far because when you drive that far, you got to drive that far north. You know, right. there's, you can't go east or west or further south. So not a lot of bands came. And, you know, there was a huge ska scene. And I like ska, but I've skanked at maybe two shows and I was drunk. So, like, <laughs> not a pretty sight. Um, and there was a really huge Christian hardcore scene. Yeah. And I was never about that. And it was always a real turnoff. So we really, like my small group of friends, we were about, like, all right, let's do our own thing. And this, you know, in the pre-internet age of, like, not knowing what other punks even looked like, just a couple pictures here and there or whatever, yeah. like the, seeing the great rock and roll swindle, you just had to make it up as you went, you right. know, and, and do your own thing. What's the power in that when you, when you don't have a lot of imagery to draw from? It's, it's like creativity. That's pure yeah. artistic creativity. Like, and you, and it's, you're, you're mapping your brain, aren't you? You're totally. Yeah, it's like critical thinking, you know, and it's like real experimentation and God really forbid. find out for yourself, like, this works or why does this work or what, why am I wearing these things and what power do I get from it, you know? And like at a young age when you're really scared and like intimidated by the world, learning what it feels like to walk through a shopping mall with a two foot high mohawk and the kind of attention that gets you, sometimes it's negative attention, yeah. but learning what it's like, that's really important lessons. What the... You know, the first time, the last time you and I interviewed each other, we, we spent time together. It was our first time uh, since it, you, you know, you, you were Lord Jane Grace. First mm -hmm. time. It's years into this now. Are you, are you still in, as interested in talking about it? Or are you, or is it, is it, is that leaving the conversation? Um, you know, it is what it is. Like, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like way progressed, mm -hmm. you know, like obviously since the last time we talked and even just like in a personal confidence level of like, it was really hard for me going into doing interviews initially at first, yeah. especially just feeling like I had to come up and show like fully formed and arrived and all figured out, yeah. you know, and like even from a visual standpoint of right. feeling like people are going to expect me to look a certain way or they're going to judge me if I don't or if I don't talk a certain way. And that really like scared me at first. And honestly, like that in interview with you, especially it was like really just so like empowering to be like. Oh, just be myself. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's fine. You know, and like, take it or leave it. I am who I am. Fuck, you we know? love you no matter who you are, man. And how you, you are. Thank you. Thank you. You know, but like, I had to learn that in real time and in learn in real time of like, okay, you know, it's going to be all right. And, you know, that's enough. Who, did you have counsel at that time? It's so hard to do these things alone, no matter what it is. No. Fuck, <laughs> you know, dude. other than like, you know, my band or yeah. like, you know, my publicist or <laughs> right. like those in that inner circle, but not really. Is, you know, there's few people you can like, and I think about this often, even still day, today with issues that I go through of like, who could I call that might have like any kind of insight of like, oh yeah, I've been there and I've been through that, you know, like, <laughs> and that list of people gets like fewer and fewer of like, there's right. just like not many people share those kind of experiences. But you now know? you're the person I suppose somebody might call. I suppose so. Yeah, you sure. Know. Yeah. Has it changed the way you, don't, you're, you relate with your friends? Um... Yeah, no, you know, like I've always tried to put myself out there, but again, it's just like a different level of comfortability where I really feel happy and genuinely like, cool. Like, oh, you're excited about coming to the show? Yeah. Rad. But you this know? is what like, I noticed. <laughs> so that's, that's what's, you know, I haven't been a fan of you for so long. When I first saw the Rolling Star article and a girl I work with showed it to me, we, we read it, we went, oh, cool. And then it was just cool. Right. And then 
I was amazed at how many people, I guess I shouldn't have been amazed, but maybe I'm amazed because Trump got elected and Brexit happened. I'm, not, I'm always surprised right. when people are nice. Yeah. I'm just surprised when people are nice. <laughs> but I just I looked at, the, at, at an against me show and I went, oh, yeah, no one seems to give a shit. They're just happy for you and whatever. Right. No, and, totally. And, and that's totally. been how it's been for you. Yeah. And I mean, like, there's, you know, there's, there's really endearing experiences too, like when we played in Oshawa the other night mm -hmm. where this dude was waiting around after the show and he came up and he's like, you know, I'm a carpenter. And at first when I heard you came out, I was, I was like, whoa. And I like, didn't know how it changed my feelings around the band because you know like my work environments all these other big burly dudes and everything like that and that next day i went to work and i wore my against me shirt and like they don't know who your band is or anything but like it was like a sense of pride for me and and then i like kind of came to terms with it and it's really like expanded my world vision and like how i view people and like people who are different from me and like moments like that awesome. are just like so impactful and you're like awesome yeah <laughs> rad man fucking rad like because i didn't same thing like i'm always surprised and you never know how it's gonna go and i not that i thought the worst of people but i do sometimes expect the worst Fuck of yeah, people especially your you fans know? can be really nasty sometimes right right yeah. yeah and in general the world at large yeah. you know like can be a pretty like homophobic or transphobic totally. place you know people can be pretty bigoted so i didn't know what to expect but people have surprised me for sure i thought it would you a lot on international women's day i thought Laura Jane has a very interesting, unique perspective on what's happening. You're not the only one who has this perspective, but I wonder what you think, because because of Trump, Pence, mm -hmm. and because of the Women's March, and then on IWD, the strike, all this beautiful stuff is happening, but in the back of my head and reading history, knowing history, you think, I can't believe we have to do this. Right. I can't believe we have to do this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that was one of my favorite signs I saw from one of those prote protests. It was like an uh, elderly woman holding a sign that said, like, I can't believe I'm still protesting this shit. <laughs> like, I was like, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess so, right? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I'll tell you, the Women's March, like, that was really an impactful day for me where I went with my, my daughter, my seven-year-old, and, like, a couple other kids from her school cool. and her school teacher and parents and, like, went down in Chicago. And, I mean, the turnout in Chicago was, like, overwhelming. And just being there and, like, being with my kid and her teacher was, like, really an inspiring moment, genuinely. I mean, you want to talk about not having any idea when you're 13 that this is how your life is going to play out. Totally, totally. Right? Yeah, I mean, if you would have told me about this <laughs> when I was 15, I never would have believed you, no joke. But if you listen to your <laughs> earlier lyrics, you could probably see that this might, I didn't know that this is what you meant, but you go, okay, now I get it. Right. There's historical context. All your diaries, did you burn them? I have not yet not because yet. I was told by the lawyer that I needed to hold on to them really? for X amount of months, but I fully <laughs> intend on burning them. But I was, I was told like, okay, you need to like, you actually need to hold on these for two seconds. For so. until the book, has, after the book edit is signed? Yeah, yeah, after it's like, you know, whatever, the initial thing. Your book is very truthful. So when you put it out there, were you worried at all? I was completely terrified. Yeah. I, you know, I did do a lot of calling around though beforehand to be like, hey, I talked about like such and such thing that happened between us in the book. And I just want to make sure you're cool with that, you know, and like a lot of things it did like were really unexpected especially like you know my relationship with with my ex as yeah. far as like i gave her the book and we hadn't talked in probably like two three years like other than just talking about our daughter you right. know but like that opened up a dialogue and it was it was really surprising it was surprising too to see like the people things things that people did have problems with were totally unexpected things really? you know really like minute details where it's like no you went to the show first and then we went to the bar <laughs> after it's like okay fine sure like, i'll change yeah. it <laughs> i like you know not that I like when someone talks about the end of a relationship, but when in, in, in your book, I like that it was the most real thing. It wasn't the trans thing that made, was the issue. It was the distance. That's, that's what crushes most relationships. Sure, yeah. Right? Right. And no matter who you are or what your situation is, if you're not around or they're not around, things become difficult. Communication falls apart. Yeah. All the time. Uh -huh. Yeah. What's it like now with, with people in your life? Are you better at communicating? Yeah, I am. I mean, like, I, I feel like I'm developing a phobia with answering emails, but, you know, other than that... Just delete. Um, That's what I do. Yeah. I just delete everything. Just let it pile up in the inbox. Um, if you need me, text me. Yeah, or send yeah. you a message on Twitter. Totally. Are you, you're calling me? Are you psychotic? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I answer, wait, what's wrong? <laughs> yeah, Why are you so, calling me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do, you know, like, I... I feel like when you're able to be yourself more so and you're present in a situation and in a relationship and you're more real, yeah. even if oftentimes or if sometimes that means the relationship ends because of it, then that's just the way it should have been, yeah. you know, but as long as you're being real, you're being real. So what happens to you then when, if you spend a large part of your life, and I've heard you use the word compartmentalizing, right? You've compart you got to compartmentalize who you were mm -hmm. before you came out as trans. Now that you don't have to spend any of the energy on that stuff anymore. Where does it go? 
I mean, oftentimes I'm like bursting at the seams with energy. Yeah. And that's where I'm like, like, you know, for instance, on this tour right now where, you know, we have a lot of downtime because we're sitting around in these arenas backstage. And I was like learning a mountain goats cover. And then I was like, I'm going to learn a mountain goats cover a day. And then <laughs> I'm like, you know, I still write in my journal every day. And, you know, we, we bought a Nintendo 64. We're playing GoldenEye. We're doing Mario Kart competitions. <laughs> we're like, I don't know. I just like, I, I'm always like trying to be engaged in something and trying to like, especially on tour, like, have it be a group activity, yeah. you know? And the band is into it. Yeah, totally. That's amazing. Thanks for coming in today. Yeah, thank you.